In the beginning, there was but a sun, immortal and all-powerful, and a universe devoid of life. The sun looked upon the earth with malice, and from this malice the first Triagon was born. The first Triagon grasped the power of the sun and became the Triagon of life and technological progress. Everything on earth began to twist and turn, pulsate and pump as the lifeless rock was thrust into pulsing vascularity. The world was alive, but without order it was plunged into chaos. From this, the second Trigon was born. The second Trigon was annoyed with the confusion and chaos of life and demanded that life become organized. Masses of flesh became intestines with which to digest, hearts with which to run the biological machinations, and a brain to direct them. With this metabolic domination, the second Trigon was satisfied. The third Trigon was born from death. The third Trigon wanted to create something great, but there was not yet worth in the world, so how could you tell what was great and what wasn't? The third Trigon elected to birth value as its great creation. It took from itself a great blade with which it cut into the boundary of power the sun contained, and it released a high volume of transactional power. From this, the flesh automatons of the earth gained value and assumed souls. The hole in the boundary of the sun quickly mended, but the power had already rained down to earth and the seeds of financial might were planted. The world was to become one of transactions, a world of conflict and discord, and the third Trigon was happy. Following this, the Earth adopted a unique new set of physical rules. The world had upper and lower planes that theoretically went on forever. A death matrix coded reality and the creatures that inhabit the Earth tore a hole in that matrix. Everything now had a value and the markets were born. A number of ancient beings and artifacts were also birthed at this time. Some fish and weaponry were among the forgettable that were created, but one weapon, the ZKZ transactional rifle, was a rifle that's damage scaled with a person's investment in the stock market. The rifle's damage could range between a flesh rat bite in the hands of a serf to an instant gib in the hands of a millionaire. Time passes, civilizations rise and fall. With the Middle Ages and modern geography referenced to within the game, it's safe to say that most history was similar to our own, geographically speaking at least. Europe is referenced. Transnistria is referenced, and Helsinki is referenced, so it's likely that geographically the world of Cruelty Squad mirrors our own, even if the history is likely wildly different. A world of conflict and discord's historical events are unsurprisingly full of conflict and discord. Food riots began in the early 22nd century and were quelled by the Cult of Order Police Department, the reigning civil authority, by gassing crowds of rioting citizens. Before the events of the game, the Cult of Order PD had been corrupted and operated with impunity in the eyes of the law as the law was up to the highest bidder. Police harassed citizens, pumped their employees with steroids, and contained their prisoners in inhumane conditions, seemingly feeding them experimental steroids and hallucinogenics or otherwise mentally debilitating drugs. Going up the chain, the government seems to be investing in military weaponry. Some of their focus is on a futuristic shock trooper able to drop from anywhere at a moment's notice and creating a gun that can be fired continually without reloading. Currently, the American government is controlled by a corporate-friendly shadow president that is happy to enjoy the power and wealth they've accumulated and satisfy the requests of corporate interests provided that they serve his own needs. Similarly, rubber cultists are a group of socially and economically wealthy individuals who exercise immense control over the world at large. They've considered and will conduct population control practices and participate in social gatherings to further their own interests as a group. Going up the chain of command finally, is a company called Control. They are a group of extremely powerful and influential individuals, most likely put into place by the sun, to guide the development of the world in a manner befit of the sun's approval. At the bottom most rung of Control's power are the sub-archons, who manage the four aspects of Control, which are finances, security, technology, and human resources. A step up from them is the corporate archdemoness, who is a point of management and communication from the sub-archons and the next and final level of worldly power, the Great Archon itself. The Great Archon acts as the ultimate authority through pure power and aggression to anyone who might stand in control's way. Corporations continuously absorb and dissolve one another, and many corporations are the subsidiary or parent company of another in one way or another. For example, Godhead Heavy Industries is a subsidiary of Cruelty Squad, 
most likely bought out when their company started to underperform following years of great success. Then Vigo's Metoids seems to be a subsidiary of Godhead Heavy Industries. Cruelty Squad's corporation's relationships are again complicated as companies give each other startup capital or proprietary knowledge even when they compete with each other laterally. For example, Cruelty Squad, a security business, gives a Go food and biocomputing company seed capital of $5 billion and research related to biocomputing and Go food industry. It's undeniable the reason for this is they will either receive dividends or can participate in insider trading, but this level of complication makes it difficult to discern which companies are actually competing with one another and which ones are mimicking competition to drive prices up. An aforementioned interesting example is Cruelty Squad providing money for a company that competes directly with one of their subsidiaries. Legality is also interesting in the world of Cruelty Squad, as methamphetamine seems to be illegal, but steroids and combat drugs seem to be legal, or at least decriminalized to the point that their acquisition isn't that difficult. The average citizen seems to be able to carry any kind of firearm without anyone batting an eye, and military-grade augmentations, firearms, and other technology are available in common stores such as malls or corner stores. This goes on to further reflect that in Cruelty Squad, if you have the money, anything is possible, and your network directly correlates to your position in the world, status in society, and overall influence on your environment. As a side note, there seems to be several extraterrestrial entities that make their way to Earth. This is interesting as there's very little explanation as to their origins, and their functions are non-uniform, so they all have largely different functions and capabilities. Some are parasites, and some help their host cognitively and help them avoid danger. While unnamed, I'll be referring to the protagonists of Cruelty Squad as John Cruelty, as they're affectionately known by Cruelty Squad fans. The story begins with John Cruelty being fired from his job at the SEC death unit after an implied freakout. In real life, the Security and Exchange Commission is in charge of fighting market manipulation, and in a world with as volatile a market as Cruelty Squads, it's not unlikely a SEC death unit is needed to further tame the wild markets. John then receives a call from a dispatcher who informs him that his interest in being hired by Cruelty Squad, a security company, has been approved and he may begin work whenever he's ready. John gets right to work for Cruelty Squad as a hands-on liquidator, killing any targets asked of him by his dispatch agent. John's first task is to take out Sigismund, an employee of Pharmacokinetics who was embezzling company funds and using those funds to participate in gambling and speculative biological currencies. John was also tasked with eliminating Sigismund's accomplice, Jerry. During the assault, John inadvertently releases one of Pharmacokinetics experiments on the public. The flesh rats. Flesh rats are a direct combination of rat and human DNA, and while a flesh rat's bite doesn't do much brute trauma, its bite releases toxins into the body that are both immediately debilitating and can remain symptomatic for as long as a week. For the rest of the game, many of the missions will have flesh rat infestations of some kind. Following John's first successful mission, he is immediately assigned another, this time taking place in an elite gated community called Paradise a community where the many wealthy inhabitants employ armed guards to protect their homes. Underneath the beautiful and friendly exterior, though, is the grim reality that the town was built on top of an ancient mass grave. John's target this time are three G-Tech executives who had received sizable startup capital and proprietary knowledge provided by Cruelty Squad themselves. However, the executives spent the money on frivolities and the expensive home properties in which they now reside. John Cruelty makes quick work of the executives and G-Tech stocks then begin to plummet until they're worthless. At the same time, G-Tech's competitor, Vigo's Metoids stock begins to rise in value. Following this, John's next mission is to eliminate the CEO of Advanced Orbital Instruments. Advanced Orbital Instruments is a space travel oriented technology company who are designing major projects to achieve space travel. Advanced Orbital Instruments' success is in no small part due to creating tactical nuclear warheads which they sell to fund their mega space projects. One project that seems to have been temporarily shelved was a space elevator. The elevator seems to have been put on the back burner in favor for another project, this time a space mission to colonize Mercury. Many elites from around the world and in different social statuses, economic classes, 
and backgrounds are interested in securing their place on the shuttle to Mercury, but it's actually a sacrificial mission to satiate some unspecified higher-ups. This is where John's next mission comes into play as he's tasked with eliminating Albrecht, advanced orbital CEO, to lower the mission's success chances. Once again, John is successful and is tasked now with securing Cruelty Squad's next power play, which is to maintain their control over the Cult of Order Police Department. For the longest time, the Cult of Order's chief of police, Mark, was useful in enforcing the will of Cruelty Squad on the public. However, in recent times he's become too sloppy and uncontrollable due to his abusing androgen steroids provided by his head of narcotics unit Magnus. This has turned Mark into a bouncy castle looking mass of flesh that spits out heavily volatile vomit. On John's return to Cruelty Squad, he's greeted by many new friendly faces who are all employed by Cruelty Squad following their previous jobs as private security and a Cult of Order PD enforcer respectively. They are some of the few friendly NPCs in the game and are seemingly impressed with John's skill and tenacity. John's next assignment is to assassinate Governor Bill Gurney, who is making a name for himself by campaigning against multinational corporations and monopolies. Unsurprisingly, he has a very large target on his head as this world is profit oriented and he stands in the way of that. Once eliminating the governor, the stock market suddenly explode in value as the opportunity of the market is no longer threatened by Bill Gurney. Following a very security heavy mission, John Cruelty returns home where he's suddenly assaulted in his own home by police officers, Cruelty Squad security agents, necromax, and police dogs. Deftly dodging and escaping the assault, it's revealed that someone at Cruelty Squad HQ accidentally fat-fingered John's social security number into the computer as a target instead of the intended target. As the markets settle, and now that John's good name has been cleared, he's given a much more difficult, complicated assignment. A group of individuals made a fortune from biocurrency speculation, and bought a boat where they indulged in depravities and declared themselves sovereign from the government's governance. This spit in the face of the government, who wouldn't go unchallenged, and they hire the best of the security firms to take out the orchestrators of the Titanium Princess as the boat was known. John effortlessly makes his way through waves of security and kills the would-be seasteaders and is given his next assignment. This time he's to assassinate the head of the Eternal Swamp Cult who has been attacking Cruelty Squad's fracking operations. As John makes his way through Boglands to kill Wild Pig, the leader of the Eternal Swamp Cult, he comes across many upended police cars and cult members wielding police equipment. It's unclear if this means that the Eternal Swamp Cult are former Cult of Order PD members, or if they've adopted the equipment of officers sent to apprehend them. John successfully eliminates Wild Pig, and the Eternal Swamp Cult devolves into endless infighting and bickering. The next mission comes from one of the highest entities in the world possible. This time, corporate archdemoness Elsa Holmes has lost the entirety of her vacation bonus at the Fatberg Casino and his tasked Cruelty Squad with eliminating the owner as retribution. Once the Fatberg Casino's owner has been eliminated, the Cult of Order PD make an appearance on the scene as Fatberg was such a high member of society that the police had to respond. John of course eludes them, however. As John's dispatcher assigns successful mission after successful mission, they begin to get drunk on power, and John's next mission is to assault the Rothenberg Fortress, home of the rubber cultist Ball, and assassinate the High Priest of the Rubber Cultist cultist. Unsurprisingly, John handily cuts through the cultists and their security and eliminates the high priest. On this mission, however, John is advised, if he's ever stuck in a rut, that he can visit Pure Optics and they'll fix him right up. Pocketing this information, John leaves and is given his biggest mission by far, an attack on Control. Control's HQ is a skyscraper office, and seated at the top of the skyscraper is Archdemoness Elsa, and under her the Subarchons. While unclear, this is likely a power play by either the Dispatcher or Cruelty Squad to fill the power vacuum following the death of Control, as Cruelty Squad seems to have their fingers in as many pies as Control does, and the rise to power would likely be seamless with the size and success Cruelty Squad currently exerts. Nobody is untouchable, except seemingly Cruelty Squad. John Cruelty, with some amount of difficulty, assassinates the Subarchons and the Archdemoness, and now only one thing stands in the way of Cruelty Squad's rise to the throne, Abraxas, the Archon. John Cruelty makes his way through the complicated Archon grid in which Abraxas resides, 
and is challenged at every corner by a new wave of powerful enemies. John approaches the most dangerous and high profile target possible. After a grueling battle and John's victory, he makes his way through the exit door and out into the world. John has achieved what there was to achieve as an assassin for hire. He felled the ruler of the world and every step of power leading up to them, with Cruelty Squad riding the coattails of his success the whole time, and now all there is to do is enjoy the spoils of his struggles with his friends at the Cruelty Squad, who look up to and admire him and his success. Despite this, however, the sun still stares at John with eternal malice, and there's a nagging feeling that, while John accepts his place in the world, he still doesn't understand or have true knowledge. John is stuck in a rut. And this is when the man in the Rothensburg Fortress's words ring out to him in his mind. John travels to the Pure Optics facility and is greeted by the receptionist, who sees the struggle and confusion written on his face, and directs him to the back room to participate in the soul emulator procedure. John participates and is suddenly flooded with knowledge and purpose as his understanding comes full circle and new opportunities are revealed to him. His ultimate opportunity, an assault on the ones who used him to become the ruler of the kingdom he'd built. John's assault on Cruelty Squad headquarters is immediately punctuated with the killing of his friends in the Cruelty Squad. He continues on, however, and while the old John might have been perturbed, the new John understands the sacrifices it takes to make it to the top. Blessed with primordial luck, John Cruelty secures one of the greatest artifacts to grace the earth the ZXZ transactional rifle, and with his net worth being as rich as it is, the rifle fires bullets with an unrelenting force unmatched by any other firearm. John stands against Cruelty Squad's chief combatant and ruler, a ghoulish looking man covered in armor, wielding a DNA scrambler and an enormous health pool. John clashes with this combatant, and an unstoppable object meets an immovable force. The result is John approaching the life exit door with the confidence of an emperor. All of John's friends are dead. All of John's enemies are dead. But there is still work to be done before he can call it quits. It's time to do what John does best and participate in a few more jobs. The first of which is to murder the punishment encryptor of one of the lower planes. The target gleefully accepts his death. The next mission is assassinating the executives of Cruelty Squad's competing firms who have all gathered at an alpine resort, most likely to consolidate their effort and resources to stand against Cruelty Squad. They're of course liquidated effortlessly. The next mission is the assassination of the former CEO of a Cruelty Squad's subsidiary who went AWOL following extreme burnout, a former great corporate leader murdered in a meat mine. The final standard mission that John Cruelty participates in is a crowdfunded assassination of reality flippers and arcology heads who took advantage of a housing market boom after an implied population control biological weapon was released and killed 99% of the population of Helsinki, an amateur job for John. John then purchases a house in a rural area of the world, right beside where the three Triagon reside and watch the world they contrived. John kills three targets who inform him of how the world came to be and Trigon's role, to which John then kills the Trigon with no further fuss and receives their blessings in the form of metabolism, financial freedom, and power. This leads John to the ultimate goal, to locate the Cradle of Life. The final mission is described as this. As a successful member of society, with a stable unflinching psych and limitless drive, natural affinity for finance and domination, you have been selected. No, you have been effortlessly guided by divine biological trauma towards this moment. The gates of destiny fling open, and once again you're left standing on pulsating nothingness, a strobing headache of the soul. John leads an assault to what looks like one of the darkest depths of the earth. The earth appears to be obsidian, the local architecture ancient, and the environment unforgiving. John, however, has been tempered in the fires of life, and while neutered in terms of power by a limit chancellor who disables all of John's augmentations and powers, he still nevertheless fights his way tooth and nail to the cradle of life. Once there, John's life flashes before his eyes, growing up on a coastal town with a thirst for power. The details of John's life are inconsequential as he's nothing but a nerve ape, the same as any other. John starts to reflect on the value of life and comes to the realization that it's negative. Life comes from nothingness, but it consumes everything around it, and therefore, life's value is negative. John, 
On the cradle of life, his throne begins to peel an onion to accentuate a point. He peels it layer by layer until the onion is gone. The realization of John's is that life is so consumed by sin and corruption in the pursuit of happiness, the realization of which is too much for the world to handle, and it tries to kill itself however unable. John, who is now the ruler of all, including the cradle of life, blesses the world with a final death, concluding the world and story of Cruelty Squad the game. Thank you all for watching the video, if you made it through this far. Uh, this was probably one of the funnest videos I've been able to make in a little while. To dissect the lore of a game so abstract was a lot of fun. And I'll say I uh, enjoyed the gameplay too. I've been playing this now for a year or two and I've had a lot of fun the whole time. I'm really looking forward to Consumer Soft Products' next game. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this lore video as much as I enjoyed making it. I'll see you guys in the next video. Later!